I will be talking about Python Bitcoin Lib. Um, first, I'm going to start with an introduction slide. This is because I keep forgetting who I am, so I have to write it down in all my presentations. Uh, no, actually, um, so uh, first, before I get started, um, Python Bitcoin Lib, uh, there's a presentation right after mine that's uh, about Lib Bitcoin. That's actually a separate project. Uh, this is Python Bitcoin Lib. Uh, sorry for the ambiguity, but it's not my fault, so... Uh, so anyway, Python Bitcoin Lib is a library of Python classes, functions, and other little helper methods uh, for representing, parsing, and serializing Bitcoin data, running Bitcoin scripts, evaluating Bitcoin scripts, and um, uh, it's a Python library. It's very useful for application development, for testing, uh, things like that. Um, before I get uh, too deep into this, I'm, I'm quite curious. Can I see a show of hands for who actually writes in Python in this audience? All right. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, so anyway, um, Python Bitcoin Lib is useful if you're doing like rapid application prototyping or something. Um, it's not a full node implementation. It's, uh, I suppose you could in theory make a full node implementation from it, but there's a lot of pieces missing. So anyway, it's, it's not a full node. Um, I believe originally this was started by Jeff Garzik um, as Python Bitcoin RPC and then it like evolved over the years passing from maintainer to maintainer or fork from fork or fork to fork rather and um, there's also a few other forks flying around called Python, Python Bitcoin RPC. One I believe made it into the Bitcoin Core repository for testing of Bitcoin Core. Uh, there's a lot of Python scripts there. Um, but anyway that's a separate branch and separate evolution of the library um, and Python Bitcoin Lib itself is currently, I guess, hosted under Peter Todd's repository, and he is ostensibly the maintainer. Although he warns that it will go unmaintained very soon, or already has, so that's something uh, people are going to have to deal with. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, Peter has been um, more interested in uh, Rust lately, um, which I'll mention in a moment. Uh, so what does the library have? Uh, it has some some of the basic data structures you'd expect, such as representing transactions and blocks. Um, it has a basic ability to represent keys and, and secret keys and things like that. Also opcodes and scripts. It can represent scripts into a sort of parsed abstract syntax tree sort of format. Or really it's just a, it's not even a tree, it's a list of operations. It can evaluate scripts and um, verify them as well. Um, and also it can serialize data, it can construct certain network messages, it has um, basic ability to interface with uh, RPC. Um, right, so it just has a bunch of grab bag items and fun things you can do. Um, so in Python Bitcoin Lib, there is a distinction between mutable data structures and immutable data structures. Uh, which is a little odd because Python is generally considered to be um, uh, not the right language to use if you want to preserve memory correctness, um, which you generally do want to do when you're dealing with Bitcoin. Um, but, but anyway, I mean, the theory behind this is that if you're going to handle transaction data in, in Python or any other language really, at least you want to try to mark which, um, which ones are like final and aren't going to be modified. Um, so in Python Bitcoin Lib, that is C mutable transaction, and then just C transaction is the immutable version. Where if you create a C transaction and you know you initialize a data structure with um, a list of transaction inputs and a list of transaction outputs, then uh, the C transaction type um, is not going to allow you to add extra inputs because theoretically that is you've already defined the transaction, and the transaction should not be able to be updated after that point. Um, also, Bitcoin Core shows transaction and block hashes as little Indian hex, and everything else is big Indian hex. So there are some conversion tools to be able to play around with data, and this is very useful if you're ever on the command line just playing around with Bitcoin stuff. Um, so X is uh, the function for big Indian hexed bytes. Um, since it's used so often, it had a one-letter name, but this is really uh, terrible if you're in a habit of using one letter abbreviations or names for your variables when you're doing rapid prototyping or testing. So just be aware that X is actually a function 
And then similarly, there's a function to go the other way, which is little Indian hex to bytes or in bytes to hex and hex to bytes and things like that, and bytes to little Indian hex. Uh, okay, so uh, the library helps you use both testnet and mainnet. So the way it does that is switching through a function called select params. Uh, signature hash, that's a, for transaction signing and uh, hashing the transaction in the correct format so that you can go and sign it. Um, I believe it actually does have transaction signing capability using OpenSSL, although uh, you should probably not intend to use it for that purpose. Perhaps for testing it's fine. Um, verify script seems to be consensus correct. Uh, you can run a script through it and check whether or not it, it ends up returning true or false. There's a bunch of unit tests and um, you can do pay to script hash um, like for multisig, uh, although it doesn't implement BIP32. Um, for that I often, uh, I use PyCoin's uh, BIP32 node implementation when I need to use BIP32. Um, so there is an RPC library for communicating with Bitcoin nodes or in particular Bitcoin Core. Um, I have often found though that I've needed to write a wrapper around the RPC connection function, especially if you ever use this in like a high volume environment where you're rapidly or in succession querying Bitcoin Core, the RPC, um, uh, because uh, there's like an RPC thread limit and sometimes you just need to refresh the connection. So often I write a decorator to that around this RPC make connection or any RPC call to, to uh, refresh the connection in the event that an error like that occurs. Um, one interesting thing to note here is that when you're developing an application uh, that uses Bitcoin Core, um, you should be careful not to treat Bitcoin Core as a database because it's really not a database even though some of the RPC interfaces used to kind of pretend it was, especially around accounts. Accounts were a good example because if you issue an RPC command um, to change an account, like um, I guess a benign one would be um, to change an account's name or something. Um, it's not really a transactional interface like you would with a Postgres database or something. So in the event that other things in your software stack have failed, um, you would have to manually go back and fix all the things that you've told Bitcoin Core to do. There's no like, there's no transactional atomicity guarantees or whatever. Um, I'm not going to talk about that. Okay. Um, another useful thing in here is sign message and verify message. This is very useful for like audits or proving that you have control over a certain key. Um, it uses, um, it's not just signing a message directly or a hash of a message, but rather there's a weird prefix. And this isn't, uh, this isn't uh, the fault of the Python Bitcoin loop, this is just a Bitcoin core thing. Um, if you want to comply with the sign message, verify message standard. And in fact, there's a new standard being proposed for, um, especially for like pay to witness pub key hash stuff or whatever. Um, uh, because in certain situations, you need to be able to prove that you have control of certain output or whatever. And um, um, sign message doesn't actually support all those scenarios. You need to, um, your, your wallet software needs to know how to produce those signatures and verify those signatures. Um, anyway, one of the reasons why there is a prefix is so that you can't do attacks. Um, like if you could just, if you just ask an arbitrary user, hey, sign this message to prove you have control, and oops, it's actually a transaction that you just signed that spins all your coins to me, you know, that would be a pretty bad vulnerability. So anyway, having a prefix makes sense. Um, also, it uses something called ECDSA pubkey recovery. Uh, this is an interesting thing. Um, I know it's completely off topic, but in Ethereum, if you've ever looked at the Ethereum transaction data structure, uh, it actually has no, um, there's no, it, it's a, unlike Bitcoin, it doesn't use UTXOs, it uses credits and debits, and uh, there's actually no from address. The, the address from which an account is debited in Ethereum is, is derived using ECDSA pubkey recovery, uh, similar to sign message in Bitcoin, uh, to derive the, the from account from the signature on the Ethereum transaction. Um, I, I regret knowing this. I don't want to know this. But anyway. Um, so anyway, we can sign messages and prove it. Uh, the URL at the bottom of the screen is an example of using sign message and verify message. Uh, 
Uh, so I'm gonna walk through an example of spinning a pay to pub key hash output. And so this scenario is that if you are paid and then you wanna spin the money that you're paid, uh, this is an example of how to go about doing that using uh, Python and Python Bitcoin lib. Uh, so, so this page of code is just uh, setting it up and importing all the required uh, functions and libraries and tools. Uh, so um, line, 25 on the screen if you can see it. It's the, the longest line on the page. Um, it's importing some of the script opcodes. Um, op hash 160, I mean this is pay to pub key hash, so there's a hash in there, right? Uh, there's a check sig because you wanna check the signature, whether it matches. Um, you need to do a signature hash because you wanna sign the transaction, um, or sign the input rather. Um, next line, you know, you have a verify script because you wanna actually check Check that this is actually working. Um, also, it's uh, select params um, mainnet because it's on, you want to use mainnet, not testnet, because that's where you were made. Um, next slide. Um, so um, before, we, before we begin, um, uh, transactions have inputs and outputs. So if you're spending this input, that you were, you were paid some Bitcoin, so now you want to spend it. So the transaction that you're creating to spend your money that you've earned is going to have to have an input. Um, for the sake of an example, we can just arbitrarily say we were paid with uh, this transaction hash ID. Um, and then the next one is the index in that transaction, of course. Um, right, anyway, and then at the very bottom, we're creating a, a transaction input uh, based off of that transaction ID and the index. Uh, next slide, and then we we um, we also have to make the um, make the script pub key, and then also we're going to make a uh, transaction output uh, because we're spinning it. And so again, this this address is provided by whoever we're spinning the money to. So that's not our data. Uh, and then finally. Um, uh, we're making a mutable transaction, and that's because um, uh, obviously we're not we're not done creating the transaction. We can have these inputs and outputs, but if you notice, the input hasn't been signed yet. Um, and anyway, then you have to actually figure out what are you signing, and so that's what the signature hash is for. You sign the script pub key from the transaction, um, and we want to cache all because we want to ensure the transaction doesn't change. Um, uh, this is pretty insecure. Don't do this in, in production code. I mean, this is using OpenSSL under the hood. But I mean, for the sake of testing and examples and demos, it's about as good as you're going to get. Um, it's just an arbitrary function. Well, not arbitrary, but anyway, it's just sign. Sign this, please. Um, so it produces the cryptographic signature. And then you can add the signature to the, to the actual script sig on the input. And um, like line 70, I mean, uh, you know, you've already created the transaction earlier at the top line of this slide, uh, but now we're modifying it by adding a script sig. That, so that's why it needs to be mutable. Um, right, okay, and then we can verify that the script sig works based off of the script pub key for that, for that input. And um, in Python Bitcoin lib, it'll just fail with a raise an exception or whatever, so. Um, I'm not going to catch the exception here. It's just out, out there laying around. Um, and then finally, um, there's a serialize method at the very end to serialize the transaction, and you want to convert that to um, hex because serialization always produces uh, uh, bytes, and you want some pretty printed hex so that you can go and copy paste that into um, send raw transaction or whatever on the Bitcoin Core RPC interface. So uh, some things notably absent from Python Bitcoin lib. Um, if you're going to it uh, to uh, implement something related to SegWit, don't because there's nothing implemented in there to handle SegWit. So um, that's something important to note. Doesn't have batch 32 from BIP 173. Uh, doesn't have BIP 32 support. Doesn't support BIP 174. Um, doesn't submit, uh, support out output descriptors, which I recognize we haven't talked about this uh, past two days. Um, 
There's no uh, proposal, um, no generally accepted proposal yet for script version two, um, which interestingly enough will actually be probably called script version one, which is very confusing, but that's because Bitcoin script is currently version zero. Um, these guys are laughing over here, but it's, it's actually a huge problem. <laughs> it's very ambiguous. Um, why, why is it still using OpenSSL? Who knows? Um, but, I mean, in general, for signing, I mean, the signature is still going to be correct no matter what, which of the two libraries you're using, but uh, perhaps an ability to switch, switch out between the two. I mean, that would be an interesting project uh, to go implement, like a simple weekend thing or something. So anyway, that's all. That's Python, Bitcoin, Lib. And just to be clear, that's not Lib Bitcoin. Thanks. <laughs> all right, any Python-related questions? So just to make sure that, that I understand, this is completely different from, in, from uh, Bitcoin D. It doesn't need it to be. That's so correct. This is not related to Bitcoin D, although the RPC interface would, re, um, if, if you want to communicate to a Bitcoin node on the other end, it would be Bitcoin D. Okay, so when I look at this, it, it seems like a great learning tool for me. But what, who else uses it? What, what are the use cases? Well, I mean, for example, I've used this in many projects for application development for um, everything from like making exchanges for handling deposits and withdrawals for um, handling um, uh, any sort of time that I've um, handled Bitcoin transactions. I mean, my two main options have been either write something in Bash with uh, the Bitcoin CLI create raw transaction interface, or you can uh, use some other language to, other than Bash and uh, why would anyone want to write in Bash? So, yeah. okay. um, so I'm one of the uh, people working on Bitcoin JSLib, and uh, SegWit support is really hard. So, gambate. Oh. Good luck. It's not my job. <laughs> so it sounds like people are using this for production code. Yes. Uh, and it's kind of scary that you mentioned that it's probably already unmaintained and it doesn't support all of these things. Um, yes. So what is the history of maintainership? Poor. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Okay. okay. Um, so I think um, here's an opportunity if you are into Python, uh, this is a way to get involved in Bitcoin development. Oh, sure, absolutely. I mean, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I mean, in general, it's considered a bad idea to use unmaintained code. Um, uh, but at the same time, though, I mean, there, there is a collection of work that has been performed here that could be useful. I mean, some of the data structures are, are quite basic and like they're not going to be deprecated. So there are bits and pieces that you could probably safely use. Other parts that you should probably stay away from. Unfortunately, this requires expertise to tell the difference. So. If someone is good at Python, who could they talk to about like reviving this as a maintained you, project. You know, feel free to talk with me or, or Peter Todd. He's also, um, he makes himself available. So those are the two starting places I would recommend. Thanks. All right, thank you very much.